The following is a comfortably zoned radio network production. We are back. Words I've wanted to say for one month. Comfortably zoned, comfortably zoned network. We've been in hiatus since the lockdown, unable to get lines because everybody is telecommuting and conference calling, and it's nice to be back. First show back is with um, uh, my oldest friend, second grade, Marty Rose, right? Hey, yeah, you got it. That's it. Absolutely. Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> So, and an original Mets fan, the show is the Mets, joined by one of the all-time mavens of uh, not only Brooklyn Dodger baseball, New York City baseball, Mets as well as the Dodgers, Mr. Robert Cole, welcome back to the Airwaves. Thank you, sir. And uh, we are going to jump right in and talk about something that's near and dear to our hearts, and that's the 1969 Mets, um, led by Tom Seaver uh, and Gil Hodges. I think there should be statues out, out in front of uh, every block in Brooklyn and Queens <laughs> with those guys should have a statue. There's no no question. Um, one of one of the things that we all hope for in the future. But um, well, they are working on one for Seaver, you know. Yeah, nice, nice. Was supposed uh, to it was supposed to uh, be finished sometime this year, I believe. But <laughs> who knows what we're going to see this year, if anything. Right. You know? In, in terms of sports, in terms of baseball in particular, in terms of congregating w- with more than two or three people. Uh, has our lives changed permanently? Start with you, Robert. That's a good question, I think. Um, yes. Well, it, well, in my opinion, it should. But, you know, with our leaders, I don't know. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, I mean, is there any way we will ever get back to the way things were? Uh, um, yeah, more or less. I, I think, you know, certain things like shaking hands, you know, should be out of the uh, question. Uh, you know, I, I don't think... Tongue kissing crowding. the hot dog vendor, that's another thing that they're, <laughs> they're talking about. I mean, people are right, glad or, to see no. him. The the hot dogs are hot, but silly, right. silly people. Um, I, in the sporting, they're talking about playing games in Arizona and Florida in front of no crowds. In, um, is that a possibility, or are we going to see that? Marty, I I I don't think so, Ralph. I mean, it is it's probably a way it could work, but the thing that's going to be working against it, uh, mostly in my opinion, is it's too damn hot. They're talking about playing in Arizona and Florida in minor league ballparks in the summertime. And 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 the and the players would have to agree to be quarantined while this is going on, away from their families. I don't think this is going to happen. I don't think so. No. Okay, we're going to lose the season, uh, no doubt. Good, My well. personal opinion is that we will not get back to any form of normality until there's a test in place until I'm sorry until there's a vaccine in place uh, testing is um it's just too many um too many facets of it antibodies and who's going to be uh immune and who's going to be um a carrier and 
Did you have it and not know it? Um, a lot of questions it, to be answered. No, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Yep. And you could test negative today and come down with it next week. Be, Correct. You know, it's just until it's completely gone, which is going to take a long time. No question about it. Yeah. Well, um, what disturbs me, and Mert and I talked off the air a little bit about opening the beaches in Florida and whatever and what have you, but there are, with good reason, these people have been locked up. They have no, they need to, to work. They need to get back to work. The, the frustrations of financial stuff notwithstanding, but the president put a three-faceted plan in place one day. The next day they protested, and the next day yet he tweets in favor of the protesters who are protesting his plan. Is this not craziness that we'll never come back from? Well, the you know, one way of coming back from it is in November, November 3rd, as the president himself mentioned today. I didn't hear him today. What did he say? Well, actually today, okay, he was somewhat, for him, conciliatory. Um, he was making nice with some of his uh, biggest, you know, critics uh, in the news staff, CNN in particular, um, and... Uh, you know, he took his usual shot at Nancy Pelosi and, you know, stuff like that. But, you know, he said, you know, you have to remember this is all about November 3rd. And, of course, most of you know what November 3rd means, don't you? <laughs> this is what he says in uh, in a group that's supposed to be reassuring the country and saying, you know, talking about what he's doing to assure the testing that we, we're talking about to ensure quarantine, because that's what's really working, is people staying in place. And he's um, he's out to lunch. I mentioned to Tally, I was talking to Tally today about dreaming my pipe dream about Amendment 25. Is it not possible that Pence, who's taking a lot of the heat, and I hate this guy, because of a number of reasons, but he's showing some presidential um, um, behavior. He can, speak, he can speak in a complete sentence. That's the right. difference. Uh, no, seriously. Anyway, what a difference. He, so yeah. he, by comparison, looks like, wow, this guy's a leader. Yeah. If you listen to what he's saying, um, he's he is much more of a leader than Trump. And he's taking a lot of heat from the governors because he's out front. And is he every now and again does he think this is crazy? I mean, I have to defend this guy every day, and he's like a roller coaster. He's you know up and down, and ideas coming and going, and changes his mind. Yeah, yeah. And you wonder, you wonder what he thinks in private. You really do. Yeah. Oh, what he says in private. Yeah. Could you imagine? Not, <laughs> not only him, but the the uh, the two doctors, Fauci yeah. and Burke. Burks. Yeah. I mean, you know, they're trying to do what's right, and at the same time, they know they can't Keep their say, jobs for the sake right. of the country. Right. I'm, and they can't say exactly what they want to say because it'll piss him off. And right. they know that, you know, if if they're not there, okay, who knows what he would do. You know, I mean, it, those two are two of the most important people in the entire country right now, and they have to walk a very fine line. I mean, I give Fauci a lot of credit. He says what he says, okay, but he says it in such a way that an intelligent person understands what he's saying. But right. Trump's, but Trump's people don't really understand what he's saying. You know, exactly. So. How many times do, has he had to say, it's the virus that determines when we're going to open. It isn't the people that determine when we're going to open. Yeah. He must have yep. said that in the last month 400 times. And Let well, me tell you a fa quick, fast story, okay? 
last night. My wife and I go to this Chinese restaurant we like. Of course, we can't go there, so I went and did a takeout order. Okay, I get to the restaurant. I was there supposed to be there at a certain time, you know, so there wouldn't be too many people there. I did that. Before I got out of my car, I put my mask and gloves on, and I go in. So, and they had everything separated, six feet apart, all that. I walk inside. There's a guy in front of me. He turns around, and he goes, you sick? I said, no, I'm not sick. I wouldn't be here if I was sick. Well, you're wearing a mask. Okay. Either you're sick or you must be a liberal. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> that's what he says to me. Well, go to my Facebook. I took some movies from my porch. There's a liquor store across the street in, here in Alameda. I took some movies of these guys mulling around the liquor store and just chatting. No masks, nothing. And they, one by one, they go in, they come out, they chat and stuff. We're supposed to be on lockdown. Uh, only go out for ne- necessities. Now, the liquor store in itself is not a necessity, but it's it's like one of these fast food stuff as well. Yeah. So um, it, pa- it passes. But um, it, it wasn't the store that that bothered me it was the people out there congregating and um it just yeah, they i think just it's over. At the end of the they, my, they think the, it's over a lot of these people you know they just aren't paying attention yeah but all right let's uh try to take our minds off what could be impending doom and it could be the gateway to a new way of life that's really good i think they're there will be eventually more telecommuting, like Marty. You were mentioning that you, your girls are both working from home, yeah, and, yeah, sure, and what have you. And um, eventually, this will drive the price of gas down, drive the price of of um, of cars themselves down. Yeah, less demand, uh, absolutely. I, I think it will, from that standpoint, we won't have traffic jams. I don't know if you have traffic jams in, in uh, traffic jams in Harlem. That's backed up to Jackson Heights. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Ralph, I, I I would where put, are you? <laughs> I would put Interstate 4 in Orlando up against the BQE and the Belt Parkway. That's, oh, how, my bad, God. Well, that's yeah. how bad it is normally. Oh, yes. Yep. Oh, 80 in... Um, in the Bay Area, traffic in the Bay Area is right up there. Mm-hmm. Remember in the 60s when I came out here, Mert, how the f- freeways were? You could just drive for recreation. You right. could get in your car Eight and lane. go out. <laughs> yeah. Right? Put the, <laughs> the top down or the windows down or whatever, and driving was fun. Yeah. And now I'd rather just take Uber. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's the um, <laughs> best way to describe it. Mm, and by the way, um, you ended that that little ditty incorrectly. It's now there's a traffic jam in Harlem that's backed up to Jackson Heights. Right. Amendment 25, where are you? <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right. Speaking of Jackson Heights and Queens, New York... Jackson Heights is where you pick up the seven to go to Shea Stadium back in the day. And there's a very interesting book that Mert sent me. He read by Art Shamsky talking about the 1969 New York Mets, the world champion, the the last pure memory of the Mets. The 86 memories are mixed in with Cats getting their heads cut off and um, and crazy drug <laughs> drug uh, days of uh, the good guys didn't win type thing. But in in '69 it was just the opposite. The good guys won. Mert, start yeah. us off. Talk about the, the uh, book. Well. It was a total surprise. What you surprise. got out of the book. Yeah, well, the book, um, he starts out talking uh, about planning a trip 
to California to see uh, Tom Seaver. And on this trip was uh, uh, Buddy Harrelson, Kuzman, uh, Shamsky, and Swoboda. And they were they were trying to uh, – this was uh, – they did it, they did it in May of 2017 and uh you know they just wanted to go out and and see Seaver before you know cuz they knew he was sick and it was just something that that they all wanted to do the problem was you know Harrison was wasn't all 100% healthy and all of them you know they're all you know older than us and 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 you know they they all aren't in in great condition, and you know Seaver, you know Nancy, his wife, had told uh, Shamsky that you know he has his good days and his bad days, and you can come. He'd love to see you, but it's possible that uh, when you get here, there could be a problem. So anyway, they they finally are able to get out there and. Uh, they they call uh, Nancy and she says, well, he he's not doing well today, but tomorrow call tomorrow morning and if everything is good, you know you guys can come out. So he's got a 116 acre uh, vineyard estate. Wine and, a wine vineyard. Yeah, a wine vineyard, and um, it's funny. I, I didn't I didn't know this, but when he planned to go out there for the first time, talking to somebody about the wine trade, he said, "Well, I want to I want to raise uh, you know Zinfandel grapes." And the guy says to him, "No, no, 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 no. This you know where you are here. This is the Napa Valley. What you're going to produce is Cabernet Sauvignon, okay? And so now he produces." 500 cases of Cabernet Sauvignon per year, and the retail price of a bottle is 150 to 350 dollars, depending on the vintage. So Tom's doing okay, you know. <laughs> but in any case. The next day when, when they called Nancy, she said he was doing well, and they went out there, and, you know, you see in the book that it was just, you know, got, they, they were so close. Uh, in fact, the whole team was close. These guys maybe were the closest, but, I mean, the whole team was very close considering, you know, what they accomplished for a team that had done nothing from, from 1962 to 1968, nothing, and nothing was really expected of them except, you know, that they they were showing signs when when they first got Tom Seaver and people realized what he could possibly be, they they got hope and they just made all the right moves that year. Uh, right. you know, we we can get into that, but I'll let somebody else talk. <laughs> all right. You talk for a minute, Robert. Um, yeah, I mean, in 68, uh, they finished ninth, and they finished ninth one other year, but, I mean, it was an improving ninth. And, uh, you know, they they started bringing in guys from different places, you know. Uh, and Gil Hodges, I guess, learned uh, platooning when he was, you know, studying with uh, Casey Stengel a couple of years, and uh, he just did all the right things. And they made a couple of good moves, you know, the Don Clendenin trade, of course. And mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if, you know, too many people remember, but Clendenin actually retired before that season started. Um, Clendenin would, had been traded uh, from Mon by Montreal to Houston, for Rusty Staub, and he refused to report, actually retired, went to business. And uh, they had to redo that trade. Rusty Staub didn't want to go back to Houston, okay, so they completed the trade. 
and Clendenin went back to Montreal, and then they wanted to trade the Clendenin to um, oh, where did they want to trade him? Uh, wherever Harry Walker was the manager, and Clendenin did not want to play for Harry Walker. Harry Walker was considered a racist. Okay, happened to be the brother of Dixie Walker who way back in 1947 started the petition mm. not to want Jackie Robinson on the team. That's another story for another day. And then uh, so Montreal finally traded uh, him to the to the Mets, and that made a big, big difference. Yeah, that was, was probably the one guys. single. One, two, three. It was about five guys they, they traded for him. The only recognizable name there is Steve Renko. The rest of them, I don't even know who these guys are. Right. Jay Carden, uh, Kevin Collins, Dave Kevin Cologne. Collins was an infielder, I think. Yeah, Yeah. well, Kevin Collins was actually uh, supposed to be the third baseman that year. He played uh, third base ah. early in the year um, before uh, Wayne Garrett and uh, Ed Charles took it over. And, uh, you know, right. they Gil traded put, Kevin Collins. Right, Gil put uh, Garrett right in there. So. Yep. That, yep. was, that was something. And Charles took a lot of pressure off him, too, against left-handers. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Uh, yeah. You know, he was the, he was really the veteran presence uh, at Charles. Right. And um, there was only three positions, I think, that didn't get platoon that year. Harrelson at shortstop played most of the year, A.G. in center, and uh, Jones in left. Right. Okay, Gro- mm-hmm. Grody, uh, actually Grody, Duffy Dyer, and J.C. Martin will play, will kill, court that year. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Grody most of the time. Mm, oh yeah. Yeah, but I mean J.C. Martin probably played. I, uh, you know, I don't have the numbers in front of me. Martin probably played 80 games, 70 or 80 games. You know, not all as a starter, but right. um, you know, every other position uh, except short, center, and left. You know. Uh, Gil Hodges platoon. Oh, Shamsky himself was a great platoon with Swoboda. Yep. Um, and and oh, yeah. um, and and Boswell was was very solid given everything. Um, Ken Boswell. I yeah. Boswell to Santana later on at short. He was just solid enough not to be weak. Where. Um, they could get by with both of them. Both teams could get by with both of them. Um, and um, they made a good double play combination. Harrelson, very underrated as a shortstop. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, Al, and Grody, and Al, uh, Al getting back also. to Grody f- for a second, uh, everybody knows he had a great arm and what have you, but Hodges and Grody were the first to see, because Grody was looking at this pitching staff, they were good, they were a solid lineup, you know, not very uh, spectacular at all, um, r- kind of run-of-the-mill, but the pitching, the incredible pitching led by Seaver. Grody saw that early on, and he and Hodges were the first two to say, well, this could be something here. Um, yeah, and Gentry gets overlooked by a lot of people, but he yes. had a terrific year. Oh, terrific. yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you had Seaver, you had Kuzman. Uh, you had then Gentry. you had Nolan Ryan coming along. Yeah, he, he was, yeah, he, he uh, pitched in relief a lot that year. Right. Yeah, he was, he was up and down. Uh, but he also made pickle brine famous, if you remember. That's right. Yes. <laughs> Keep he, the I think it was, <laughs> was it Pignatano or or Walker? It was the pitching coach, Rube Walker, who devised this, the pickle brine thing um, for blisters, mm. where he, um, of, of all, um, of all liquids to, become medicinal. Um, yeah. yeah, actually, I think it was uh, Walker and Lou Niss was the trainer in those days. And, uh, he was the, Lou Niss was not the Lou traveling Niss, uh, secretary, 
Yeah, the reason I know that is not the trainer. The family uh, name of yours. Re- same name as my grandfather. There you go. No, no relation. Right. No, uh, but he was, Ludness was the first hiree of the Mets. First, mm. um, when they bought the team, when, um, you know, Mr. Payson, um, yeah. Payson. Right. yeah, Whitney Payson uh, got the team. Ludness was uh, was hired, and um, but as traveling secretary. But whoever it was, the trainer, um, Gus Mock, Gus Mock, exactly. Who, if I'm not mistaken, was the trainer of the Yankees back in the day? Yes, he was yeah, with uh, Casey true. Stengel and uh, George Weiss. Yeah. Yes, yes. Whoa. So we can go over some of the highlights that year. I mean, uh, there was a lot of highlights that year. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they had a, a, a eleven game uh, winning streak between May twenty fifth and June tenth, which they were eighteen and twenty three when it started, and they were twenty nine and twenty three at the end of that. And then, and then they pick up Clendenin. And then, like, a couple of weeks later, Seaver has that imperfect game where uh, he's perfect up, perfect into the ninth inning and gives up the Jimmy Qualls hit. Yeah, I heard that on the – that was on a Saturday, and I heard that on, a ra- on the radio in the parking garage at New York Life. Wow. And I sat in the radio. Uh, with that until the very end, and I went, oh, Jimmy yeah. Quails. Yeah. Ninth inning, was it? Oh, yeah. Yeah, nine, yeah two outs right in the ninth inning. Right, right, right. Unbelievable. Oh. And then we got, uh, let's see, between uh, the August 16th to 27th, they won 12 of 13. And then September 9th was that black cat thing with the Cubs. When yes. the, black, the black cat came out into the on deck circle, and that I was think it end. was Ron Santos. Stan, that um, was the end of the Cubs. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember Santo did that leg kick, he jumped up in the air with with a leg kick separating. I, se- I, I have a quote. Set. I I have a quote of, from Gil Hodges about that. Did you ever see that one? I don't remember. He says, uh, the next day, uh, Santo is given the lineup card to the umpire, and Hodges is out there with him. And he says, you remind me of Tug McGraw when he was young and immature. He used to jump up and, he used to jump up and down, too. He doesn't do that anymore. <laughs> When he was young and <laughs> immature. <laughs> you gotta love it. I mean, he could stick so the much. he could stick the needle in, and you didn't, don't even know you were stuck. <laughs> oh god! And then the the, the double one nothing game where Cardwell and uh, Kuzman both hit home runs. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Don Cardwell and was it Kuzman or Cal Coons? Cal Coons. Cal Coons? Okay. Cal Coons. But that, that's n- never happened before or since, the, where the, the pitcher had the, the only hit of the uh, the only uh, hit a home run in both games, and they won one nothing both games. So I mean, yeah. hey, was, while I'm thinking of it, Mert, where were you when this was going on? <laughs> I, was, I was listening on Armed Forces Radio as much as possible, you know. <laughs> Uh, you know, the the good part about it was um, when they had it on, and it was a night game, and it was uh, like a maybe on national radio. Uh, I had we had it on in my office. You, you know, could listen to it because it was the morning by us, twelve right. hour time difference. You know, but when they played the day games, like in the World Series back then, I had to stay up all night. To, to listen to it on the radio, which I did. I listened to the first game, and they lost. I was very upset, very upset. So I, I the next night I didn't listen. I, I you know, I slept, and they won that game. 
so then the, the next three games, obviously, I had to stay up and listen uh, all night with the transistor under my pillow. <laughs> Just like like we did when we were kids, you know? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Didn't want to wake up any of the other guys. Twelve you know, uh, man hooch I was in. Uh, Robert, some of your memories. Um, well, a lot, a lot of the same memories. Uh, you know, the starting out, I mean, you you guys know I was a big Gil Hodges fan, so, you know, it was right. a, a great ride for me, you know, seeing what he did. And uh, what people forget, too, is in 68, he had uh, a heart attack late in the season and um, missed the last, uh, last couple of weeks of the season. And, uh, you know, came back in 69 and did all the right things. My biggest memory was uh, the games in September, they had those two games against the Cubs, like Marty was just talking about, the Black Cat game and stuff. And, um, you know, Leo DeRocher was the manager of the Cubs, of course. And when the Mets came up in the bottom of the first inning, as Leo used to do back in the day, he had his pitcher throw right at Tommy Agee's head. And <laughs> Agee went down, and, you know, and you say to yourself, you know, here's that intimidation thing. And then Ron Santo came up in the, uh, in the top of the second, and Jerry Kuzman drilled him in the arm. And that pretty much settled that. You know, I mean, if nothing had happened, uh, you know, that intimidation factor comes into play. But, you know, Gill had seen that act from DeRosha. He, he played for DeRosha. He knew about that. I'm sure he probably said something to Kuzman. Maybe he didn't have to say anything to Kuzman. Kuzman drilled, uh, drilled Santo, and that ended all that. And then uh, the Mets won those two games, and it was all downhill after that. I remember the, uh, the pennant clinching game, too, against the Cardinals. Yes, yes, I remember I remember that. But I remember Leo DeRocher screwing up his pitching staff, much in the way that Gene Mark screwed his up with the Phillies in 64. Yes. Yep. I, I I think he pitched a, a whole bunch of pitchers on uh, very little rest. Do you have any specifics of that, either of you guys? Yeah, I'm, he started pitching, uh, he started to panic. Uh, he was pitching Ferguson Jenkins and Bill Hand uh, almost every other day, it seemed. Um, yeah, he he went down, and you know, uh, Charlie Dressen did that back in '51. Gene Mock did it, and uh, and Derosha did it. And of all the the three of them, you wouldn't think Derosha would panic like that, but he did. Exactly, especially all those years later, um, when he he got some perspective on it. Um, but he'll always be remembered for screwing screwing things up that way. Um, as long as we're talking about the 69 Mets, i got to give credit to a fellow by the name of Whitey Herzog, who was a coach with them uh, when I came back from the Air Force. Marty, do you remember my uncle living in that big red building across from Shea on Roosevelt Avenue? Um, Your uncle that took us to the Y, you mean? Uh, yeah, yeah. He okay. lived there yeah. for a while. There was a swimming pool in that building, and I'd come back from the Air Force and um, hang with Whitey Herzog, who lived wow. in that building. Wow. And Whitey Herzog went on to be, um, and I've talked about this before, I don't know what they call them, director of player personnel or whatever um, whatever name they came up for, for him, he was credited um, with helping Bill being instrumental in building the 69 team. Mm. Um, he was, uh, be, I mean, this is before he managed um, a Hall of Fame career. He yeah. learned a lot from, from Casey in Casey's Instructional League. 
and um, yeah, that that doesn't get publicized a lot, Ralph. You know, I, what, I know, I yeah. know, but um, and uh, I don't know if it's in my favorite Met book, but I want want to give a little bibliography besides um, besides the Shamsky book. What books in those days was uh, I'll tell you mine after you guys tell me yours. Um, Chronicle those times best. Um, start with you, Robert. Mm. There, there are so many of them. Uh, which ones did you? Which one did you particularly like or dislike? Titles. Uh, are escaping me right now, Ralph. Okay. Well, yeah, well Breslin wrote a book. Yes. Um, well, can anybody, uh, can anybody play, this, play game? this game? <laughs> he wrote one. <laughs> um, thoroughly entertaining and very truthful. Uh, uh, Al Blumkin tells a story. I don't know which book it's from, or um, about he Casey sitting on the bench before a game with Gene Woodling, and remember Woodling was with him in in the streak. He was one of those guys that, one of those 13 that played on five consecutive world championships. And um, you know how Wo- the Woodling days were with the Mets were going in 62. Um, Casey looks over him and says, it's not the same as it used to be, isn't it? <laughs> just <laughs> and God knows it wasn't. So um there you go. That's uh but my favorite book was Leonard Coppett's book and I that title escapes me. But it is so comprehensive about the forming actually it goes up to nineteen sixty nine if not in the original book, in the revised edition. And it really hits the nail on the head. And he had one quote when they were bad. He said, Leonard Coppett says, he was walking walking out of the ballpark once, and um, uh, a fan says to him, he was on his way out and just couldn't leave. And he says, it hurts too much to leave, but it hurts more to stay. <laughs> Wasn't just watching those guys, but um, so Leonard Coppett is the guy who gets my vote. But um, there's a bunch of books that uh, chronicle those times. Durso yeah. is one of them. I can't remember some of the names, Ralph. I remember there was one by a relief pitcher, one of the first ones. Maybe he's on the Reds. I can't. I'll never call him. Oh Brosnan. yeah, a uh, Brosnan, Brosnan, Jim Brosnan. Yeah, that's Brosnan. Two, that's the two one. terrific books. That Not about good. the Mets. No, 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 no. But about the times, like you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, one one was the uh, the pennant the pennant race, I think. The, the pennant chase and the long the pennant chase season. and the long season. The long season. That was the one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that was it. Excellent. That was well, great. There was one of them, they really put, we'd want to know what was going on in their heads. <laughs> That's what, as kids, I mean, what's it like yeah. to to be in right. there? And I remember <laughs> Brosnan talking. He says, he's out in the bullpen. It's the seventh inning. He's about to get started. And here comes his wife holding a baby. And she's coming down the stairs towards the stands towards the bullpen. She couldn't take it anymore. She had the baby and she <laughs> she's coming to the bullpen to give the ba- the baby to Brosnan to hold for a while. <laughs> so it really ma- made me laugh and, and it informed me that these guys are human. Yeah. They they're not statistics. Right. Every, every day they're going to perform based on their heads, based on how much sleep they had the night before, based yeah. on how they're getting along with their significant smother. 
um, all those things. Um, Absolutely. So, and then, uh, and then of course the other the one is, book. you know, <laughs> it's Jim Bouton book. Yeah. Oh God. Oh, yeah. 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 And Bill Veck's books. Veck oh, is in Rex. Jesus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Veck's um, books are great. Absolutely. Yep. And Joe Garagiola had um, a cute book. I mean, these books, uh, baseball's a funny game. Um, humanized. But it was some book that somebody actually wrote about Vec, uh, maybe, I don't know, five, six, seven years ago. I, it was unbelievably great also. He didn't write it, obviously, but about, about him and everything he did, just incredible. Yeah, you guys weren't on the show, but I had Mike Vec, his son, on one of the oh, shows. Wow. Oh, that was trippy for me. Mm-hmm. Um, because every when we were kids, everything revolved around Vec. It, it, um, the thing with the midget, um, breaking right. the color ba- barrier La- in Lady the American Day. League. Didn't he invent Ladies' Day? I think so. Uh, I, I don't know. I think he did. I I might, very might have, very well might have. Um, The exploding scoreboard. He (laughs) brought Larry Doby in, and um, later, later after the after the Indians, he built the White Sox. Uh, If I'm not mistaken, the '59 White Sox were his. Were his? Yes. so, a fascinating guy. And Mike Vick, his kid in his own right, owns the most successful independent team ever, the St. Paul whatever. And he sent, like, a lot of guys to the big leagues, or, including Daryl Strawberry, who was um, well. was with that team for a while. Mm. So, um, Great. hey, Guys, what a terrific show! Um, well, it's good I want to end it by yeah. I, I want to end it by bringing it together, and uh, both of you completing what your thoughts were about the '69 season. <laughs> well, um, a complete it was a complete shock, Ralph. You know, just totally unexpected. Out of nowhere, uh, I'm just I'm just sorry I missed I missed the whole year. <laughs> you Did you get to see the Knicks in those days? In, um, well, it was in 1970, right? They won the next year, wasn't it? Yeah, right. I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I was uh, back then. I was in Massachusetts then. I was able to I was able to see that. In our lives, there will never be another year for New York City sports. Well, I missed the Jet Super Bowl too. So. Oh, that was because oh. I, I got there in December of '68, and uh, you know until December of '69. So, you know, I missed the Jets, the Mets, uh, moon landing, Mickey Mantle Day, Woodstock, uh, <laughs> whatever else you want to say that happened that year. A lot of stuff happened that year. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And plus the assassination started going down, too. Well, yeah, that, uh, well, uh, the, the Robert Kennedy one was, uh, I was in Texas. That was before, that was in 68. Right. Yeah, so. But you had Martin Luther King. Um, right, right. That was, that was before, before Kennedy, I believe. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. remember yeah. those were back in the days when we thought, these are harrowing times. Yeah. yeah. They sure as hell were. They, yeah, they were. But now, um, this. Th- yeah, this yeah. is um, beyond surreal. Yeah, it certainly is. It's All right. completely crazy. All right. Let's hope for the best and uh, prepare for the worst. Stay indoors. How about that one? Good one. Not just you guys, but everybody out there listening. And um, it was a good show. Thank you, guys. Robert, any before we go, Robert, anything to close with? Um, Don't want to cut anybody off. No. <laughs> uh, 
uh, just stay safe, uh, you know, so we can do right now. Yes. And Cuomo's yeah. visiting Trump tomorrow, so that might be interesting. Might be very interesting. And as you guys know uh, from my ramblings on Facebook, I'm not a big Biden fan. I want Trump to lose any way he can. I don't think oh. Biden is the guy to run. I think Cuomo is showing leadership and bringing at least the Democratic Party together. And well, Biden is crickets. I mean, we don't hear anything from him that that's um, newsworthy. Well, you know what would be interesting, and uh, I read a story online by uh, a Democratic uh, guy, somebody in the Democratic Party, who's saying that there's a groundswell to have uh, Michelle Obama become the vice president, you know, oh, run, as, run as the vice president. Oh, God. Um, she wouldn't. She, she would not take it. I don't think those, the Obamas, are that big on the Bidens. It took well, Biden longer. It took Obama a long time to get behind Biden. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you, you also have to remember. I don't think Biden would make it through a full four-year term, and. One way to probably win would be to have her on the ticket, because then you get, you know, the uh, the Obama. Uh, well, she's got no she's got no government experience. I mean, if it's going to be a woman, uh, you know, Klobuchar or Harris or even Warren, I, I like Klobuchar and I like Harris both. So. Harris is a prosecutor. Mm-hmm. So right there it gives you some idea. Well, but, I always, I like I like Klobuchar from I do know, too. From I the, do uh, too. very much debates, so. So uh, who knows? We'll see, Ralph. We'll see. We'll see. But uh, you know, Ob- uh, Michelle Obama, Biden is probably thinking, I like the nape of her neck. <laughs> 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 no, let's, let's not go there. <laughs> I was trying to tell him the same thing. <laughs> Don't go there. It's, too, you know, <laughs> it's, it's not doing you any good. It may not hurt you, but it can't possibly help you. Um, <laughs> at least I made you guys laugh. That's all I can do for an old guy in a small town in cooped up in the, in the house for five consecutive weeks. Um, I'm glad I kept my sense of humor. All right. Be well. Come back. The next show we have. Okay. We'll figure we'll that do. out along the way. All right. Have a good All night. Right. Be well, Robert. Be well, Marty. Thank I'm you. Ralph Tycho, Comfortably Zone Radio Network. It's the Mets in the zone. Good memories tonight, guys. Thank you. And thank you for listening, everybody. Good night. Good night. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.